where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nopithanchel. $400 million from the federal government helped keep Connecticut renters in their homes during the pandemic. They received rental assistance through the Unite CT program, which began last March. But the program has stopped accepting applications, and there are no plans by state lawmakers currently to keep Unite CT going after the end of the month. Meanwhile, housing advocates say evictions have gone back up to pre-pandemic levels. Today, where we live, we talked to Connecticut Public Radio's housing reporter, Camila Vallejo, about the crisis. Unite CT helps Connecticut landlords, too. What do they want to see policymakers do in the months ahead? Already, more than 50 percent of all renters are cost burdened. We hear from the Connecticut Coalition of Property Owners. And later, there are increasing demands on both the rental and buyer's market. We're going to hear from a Connecticut realtor and also talk to the National Community Reinvestment Coalition about the structural issues that keep people from becoming homeowners. Now, are you struggling with rent or finding an apartment, or are you struggling to buy in the current housing market? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Our first guest, guest again, Camila Vajejo, joins us on Zoom, Connecticut Public's housing reporter. Camila, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I mentioned that uh, evictions are going back up to pre-pandemic levels. You recently uh, profiled a family of seven who were evicted from their home in Norwalk. They fell behind rent uh, during the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about their story. Absolutely. So Victor and Amelia are two Norwalk residents uh, who were recently evicted from their home of three years uh, with their five children. Uh, The family fell behind on rent last spring. At the time, the father was ill and the wife was pregnant, uh, unable to work as much as they were used to. And like many other residents in Connecticut, they fell on hard times. uh, And despite the fact that they took advantage of Unite TT, Uh, they really weren't able to get back up. Um, And unfortunately, they were evicted in February uh, with just $30 in his pocket. uh, Victor had to find a way to um, keep his kids uh, with a roof over their head. Um, And he was referred to 211, uh, which is the United Way hotline in the state. um, And he was connected to a shelter in Norwalk. um, And the shelter booked him temporary stay at a local hotel, and now they're helping them find uh, stable housing. Um, But that's a little bit hard in today's uh, housing market. Hmm. And we'll be talking about that coming up uh, on the show. You mentioned that they were able to apply for rental assistance, but it took a long time for them uh, to be approved. And I I think that has been the case for for many people that uh, were waiting on Unite CT. What can you tell us? Give us some context about the program and the backlog. Absolutely. So the program um, is funded uh, by federal COVID dollars, um, and it was meant to uh, help tenants uh, stay housed during the pandemic, uh, seeing that, you know, if if they went into the shelter system, unfortunately, uh, social distancing uh, was a bit harder. Uh, And the program, I think uh, a lot of people over at the Department of Housing, the way that they describe it is very accurate. Uh, It was a plain uh, that had to be built while it was flying. Uh, so it, it was a very large program uh, that had very little prep time and they had to fix the, the kinks while they were ready, um, you know, on the road. And um, unfortunately, it took a very long time to get the money out because, you know, the, the, the application was fully online. It required a lot of documents and it required um, both the tenant and the landlord to work collaboratively Um, And during this time, a lot of those uh, tenant landlord relationships were broken because of financial distress. Um, So it it was hard to get uh, people to work together and to get the money out. Um, So, you know, that that was a very big concern. And specifically in Victor's case, uh, there was a lot of um, hesitancy as to whether he would be eligible for the program because he wasn't documented. Uh, So that is one of the main reasons why it took so long for for him to be successful in getting that rental assistance. You mentioned uh, the family, um, several of the members uh, were undocumented. And so with the way the state rolled out Unite CT, they were able to still get um, some assistance uh, despite that, Camila. Yes, so uh, Unite CT 
uh, you know, was open to uh, anyone despite legal status. Uh, but it did require people to have some sort of ident identification. Um, and as far as the undocumented community goes, not everyone has a documentation or a form of ident identification. Um, so I think that that's where the discrepancy was or the access barrier uh, for this family. Again, you talk with them in the hotel room where they are now living, Victor and his family. Let's hear a little from him in his own words. Yo quiero que, que, hay, que vean las personas que, que se puede salir adelante, ¿me entiende? Que se puede salir adelante y que, y que no importa a veces lo que pase, siempre hay una salida, ¿me entiende? And Camila, tell us what Victor is saying and, you know, why, uh, uh, you know, he wanted to share that particular sentiment. Absolutely. So he mentioned that he wants people to see that you can get ahead and it doesn't matter what happens. There is always a way out. Um, so I think Victor's sentiments are a little bit layered. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, he was undocumented and like many migrants, uh, he came here for better opportunities for himself and his family. And he never thought an eviction would be part of his American dream. Um, but, you know, when the situation came, he confronted it the best he could. Uh, not all, but many in the undocumented uh, community are sometimes scared to seek help because of their lack of legal documents and they fear retaliation. But that definitely wasn't Victor's case. Uh, he was willing to find help at any cost to keep a roof over his kids' heads because he says that the last thing he wanted was uh, to lose his kids. So now that he went through this process and understands that he can live in this country and get the help he needs despite lacking legal documentation. He's a big ag advocate for letting people know, uh, especially those that might be scared, that there is help. I had mentioned at the top of the show that eviction rates are now uh, moving up and are getting back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, tell us why that is, Camila. Obviously, again, Unite CT not accepting any new applications, but there's some other factors related to even the governor's emergency orders during the pandemic. Absolutely. Uh, so during the pandemic, like you mentioned, uh, there was Unite CT and there was a lot of protections for renters. Uh, so when when it came to evictions for some time, evictions uh, really weren't moving. And then when they were, especially for uh, non-payment of rent evictions, uh, landlords were uh, really encouraged to apply to the Unite CT program before even moving uh, with an eviction. So that kind of uh, decreased the amount of eviction filings that, that were going through the court system. Um, but now all of that uh, is over. Uh, so landlords can use the court system again, as they did before the pandemic. Um, and seeing that, you know, for some time that wasn't an option, many landlords are taking advantage of that given their uh, specific situation with their tenants. Um, and then also, you know, rents are up across the state by 15%. Um, so as many people are trying to get back on their feet, um, some might not be able to find other places to go when their landlord uh, mentions that they might uh, file an eviction. Um, and the, really all that does is, you know, lead people into the shelter system, uh, very similar to uh, Victor's case. When we talk specifically about evictions going up, what has the Connecticut Fair Housing Center told you about the number of cases filed just this month alone? Yeah, so this file, we've seen more than 1,500 eviction filings, and we haven't seen numbers like that since January 2020 before the pandemic. Um, not, not to bog down listeners with uh, a lot of numbers, but prior to the pandemic, on, on average, um, about 20,000 evictions were filed a year, and advocates over at the Connecticut Fair Housing Center fear that you know, this year we might see that number again, or it might even uh, surpass it given uh, the housing market that we're in. You're hearing with us on Zoom, Camila Vallejo, Connecticut Public's housing reporter, as we talk about evictions rising in our state uh, later on, uh, other factors impacting both the rental and buyer's market in Connecticut. You can join our conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Camila, you mentioned uh, rent is going up in our state. Your story also touched on some persistent disparities for renters in our state. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I think when when talking uh, about evictions, 
um, it's important to understand that it can be very layered and it can affect people differently based on their race, their gender, um, and of course their income. Um, so the Connecticut Data Collaborative and the Connecticut Fair Housing Center uh, evaluated eviction filings between 2017 and 2021. And it found that black and Latino renters had cases filed against them at higher rates than white renters. Um, more specifically, black renters were three times more likely uh, to have an eviction filed against them than white renters and Latinos were two times more likely. Um, and when you look further into the eviction data, you, you find that uh, women of color are hurt the most by evictions. So, you know, that's, that's another thing that the renters are facing across the state. Uh, you focus a lot on Fairfield County in your reporting. And so when we talk about uh, the strain on the rental and housing market, what's unique specifically when we're talking about Fairfield County? Yeah. Uh, so when we're talking about Fairfield County, specifically right now in this moment, uh, rents are pretty high and that's all based on demand. Uh, so one thing that we saw during the pandemic is that, you know, the way we approach the work, we completely changed. Uh, and a lot of people were fortunate enough to work remotely, and that opened up the possibility of living anywhere. Um, so we saw a good amount of New Yorkers taking that opportunity and moving to Connecticut, and many landed in Fairfield County. Um, you know, the average asking rent price in New York right now, according to Redfin, is over $3,500 a month. So, of course, prices in Connecticut are more affordable. Uh, but that just means that with an already existing housing shortage in Fairfield County and across the state, uh, those who are trying to survive rent increases are fighting with newcomers who are willing to pay the high price. And in that fight, there's obviously a clear winner. Uh, so it's a very competitive market in Fairfield County. Uh, earlier, we talked about Unite CT. Again, this is a rental assistance program that uh, gave tenants protection so that they didn't lose a roof over their head, but also helped Connecticut landlords, too, with this uh, federal money that helped uh, pay the rent uh, during this time. Uh, we wanted to hear the perspective of Connecticut landlords and what they want to see from policymakers uh, moving forward. Joining us now on Zoom is John Souza, who's president of the Connecticut Coalition of Property Owners, and he's also a full-time I'm landlord. John, welcome to our show. Hey, good morning, Lucy. Thank you for having me. Uh, the pandemic's been tough on everyone. And when we think about uh, property owners as well, uh, not all, uh, um, you know, living out of state um, with um, a big portfolio, lots of small business owners are property owners. And so they are impacted as well. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about who you represent and what you've heard from them with the Unite CT program. Sure, absolutely. Um, most of our members are small landlord groups around the state from Enfield, Norwich, you know, all the way down to New Haven, Bridgeport, um, mom and pop organizations, small business people, a lot of part time people, a lot of people that live in the property that they rent. Um, you know, the type of places that when you got your first apartment, you probably met the person and you know, owned it in person, shook hands and moved in. So, you know, regular small business people. Um, when the United CT, well, when the pandemic happened, obviously, um, there was a big uh, dam built across the eviction system, and luckily the Unite CT program came along. Um, they did a great job at DOH getting it going. I heard what Camilla said, and I agree. They worked day and night down there to make it happen. Um, unfortunately, it had some problems. Uh, yeah, it was slow, which is like every bureaucracy ever, but you know, they tried to do the best they could. They did some things to help that make it go forward, and it worked. And if the landlord and tenant were cooperative with each other, there was money distributed. It helped a lot of people, helped a lot of landlords. So that's what it was supposed to do. Um, unfortunately, what happened was that because the governor um, had all these you know, stops in the system, rightfully so initially, but kept them going because feeling that the United CT system was there to help, um, a lot of people took advantage of the whole system too and stopped paying intentionally, unfortunately. And a lot of landlords were hurt pretty bad. Um, I'm seeing now in some of the pages that you know, people owed months, years of rent uh, coming up with 1.2, 1.3 years of rent. And they're just getting to the system again. You know, the evictions are going again um, to get these people out, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. When you talk about evictions and some of the um, the measures that the governor took, so obviously the eviction moratorium during the pandemic yeah. that has since ended. Uh, but when we think about the cost that a landlord's shoulder 
I can't imagine that, you know, evictions, that they add to the cost when you think about having to go to court. And so, you know, what is a way forward uh, to not only help these small business owners, but also to keep people housed, John? What do you want to hear from policymakers? Sure, sure, absolutely. So first of all, there is no other way for a landlord and tenant to resolve their disputes. There's only the eviction system, right, which is a summary process, it's called. And in Connecticut, it's a system and it used to take less time. Now it takes more time, which is a problem. They've added automatic representation from the tenants where they used to have a system where you would go in and there was a mediator kind of meet with them. You know, in the last 20 years, landlords have had to hire lawyers. We didn't have any choice because of the LLC system. You get the protections from it, but you can't represent yourself. I used to go represent myself. Today I can't. So it adds more costs to the system. Um, if the system worked quickly and efficiently, people, believe it or not, oh, excuse me, let me start with this. An eviction doesn't automatically mean you're thrown out. It means you go to court and usually you make an agreement. Everybody mostly gets a second chance. So you go to court, you make an agreement, you're back on your feet. I could pay this plus something off your arrears and you could stay. And if they do what they agree to do, then they could they become a tenant good standing again and they just go on with their life, and, uh, which happens a good amount of time. It's not automatically when you file an eviction, you got to go. Um, so I just want that to be clear. Nobody wants evictions. It's expensive for the landlord, it's traumatic for the tenants. We get it. Um, but there's no other system. So if we could make that system efficient for everybody, take some of the costs out of doing business in Connecticut would be a good thing. And you know what? They used to show up at court with a checkbook. There was programs. CRT had a great one. And they said, if you guys make an agreement today, we'll give a month or two of rent, you know, to make it happen, to help the tenant and it helped the landlord. Um, it was quick and efficient. Didn't require three or four months of, you know, backlog to make it happen. So, you know, those are the kind of things that would make housing less uh, more affordable in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You mentioned efficiency is important. One, there have been also calls from some state lawmakers that Unite CT uh, shouldn't end, but of course uh, the money's got to come somewhere. And so, sure. in, from your standpoint as uh, president of the Connecticut Coalition of Property Owners, do you believe that Unite CT should continue? You know, it would be a good way to help these people that struggle all the time. If you know, you can't put the burden on small business people, small landlords to support these people when they keep having trouble to, you know, pay the rent. At some point, someone's got to help them or they have to move. Unfortunately, that's the way it works. We have bills to pay. We have taxes to pay. You know, we have mortgages, staff, everything else sometimes. Um, you know, it, it's somebody's got to help. If it's a public benefit, the public should pay. And this is probably a pretty good way to do it, Unite CT. Um, I don't know if they could streamline it more. They probably can as time goes along. That would be a good way to do it. And you know what? To be honest with you, if they could keep people out of court, it would be a better thing. If someone could just go down like they do now and say, hey, I'm having trouble. My husband's sick or, you know, I, I lost my job. Can you help me for a month or two? And it would be really quick before the eviction system would get involved. That would be the way to go for everybody, right? It would save money for everybody in the long run. Mm -hmm. I can get public's housing reporter still with us, Camila Vajejo. Camila, tell us what you've been hearing from lawmakers. I think there, is there another proposal to maybe allocate some state funding uh, to, again, provide um, some assistance for people who still need it? Yeah, Lucy. Uh, you know, so earlier this year, uh, the Black and Puerto Rican caucus uh, called on the state to bring back uh, UNITT because it still has a lot of good it can do. Um, specifically the chair of the caucus, Gerardo Reyes. Um, he, you know, mentioned that, um, you know, a lot of the people that need the help right now are just finding out about the program. Um, so, you know, there should be the opportunity for it to open up again. And he uh, mentioned in his proposal, proposal that he would like to see uh, around 250 million from the state. Uh, go to this program, uh, you know, to help uh, the remaining people that are in this situation uh, and need to get back up on their feet. John, when you hear that, are you hopeful? <laughs> you know, I, I think it would be the, the most cost effective way to get everybody, you know, help and get back on their feet. Let's let's uh, we all know that if someone gets evicted, it's very expensive. You know, the state has to support them, has to give them rent security to get back into a place. They might be homeless for months on end. Um, so keeping them in the apartments they are now, if they could work out a deal with the landlords that's there, I think that's a very efficient way of doing it. Um, so let's hope they do do something along that lines. It's got to be efficient. It's got to be fast. I mean, 
you know, we've been patient people for a lot last two years and it's been rough on a lot of us believe it um, i know people that are really struggling as landlords it's not a high margin business and there's you know if we can't stay afloat it's not to anybody's benefit you know, less housing less everything nobody wants to come and do it uh, john when you talk does. about john when you talk about some of these uh, small business owners you know who have property who've been renting for years because of uh you know They've, they've lost money in the pandemic, and we know uh, inflation is leading to landlord costs going up. Also, inflation impacting how far a dollar goes uh, for to help uh, a low-income or moderate-income family. Are you hearing from some landlords who are saying enough's enough? They can't continue this, and they are selling off property now. Um, yes, that is happening. Um, a lot of people are selling to out-of-state people, unfortunately, I, I guess, Connecticut looks, you know, very appealing if you're from out of state, some New York or something. And let's be honest, the out of staters don't care as much. It's maybe just a number on their spreadsheet. Um, They're not the same as the small mom and pop organizations that live in town and, you know, are support the baseball team that the kids are on or whatever. So, yes, it is a problem. And hopefully it, it won't continue. Connecticut's a high expense state. We all know that for everything, right? Not just the real estate. It's an expensive place to be. We need to try and make it more affordable all the way around. And that always ends up passing down to the cost of living too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Camila, we, I've talked with John about, you know, the long-term impact on landlords, many who are small business owners. Uh, we're hearing from a listener who suggests, you know, it's time for good cause eviction in Connecticut. It's time to erase eviction records from the court or judicial system where those records, even no fault lapse of time evictions are used against people hurting them for years. Can you talk about that long-term impact on tenants who have to go through eviction proceedings, how that impacts their housing stability too? Absolutely, Lucy. Um, so, you know, an and eviction can be very harmful and it, it, it doesn't just hurt a tenant uh, when it's happening. It can hurt them for uh, multiple years on end. Uh, you know, right now in Connecticut, I believe uh, an eviction record stays on a tenant's record, even if the um, uh, eviction judgment was in their favor or if it was dismissed or withdrawn, it stays on the record for about three years, I believe. Uh, And that really, uh, you know, keeps people from finding uh, other kind of stable housing, Uh, you know, because uh, what advocates have told me and what tenants have told me is that when they go to apply uh, for housing and a landlord sees any kind of uh, uh, eviction filing, you know, they automatically assume that they're not a good tenant. Um, So these uh, evictions can be very harmful. And the fact that they're open to the public for that long can be very harmful. So like, Uh, the listener mentioned right now um, in the housing committee, there are a variety of bills that hope to um, shrink the amount of time eviction records are available to um, 30 days if it's uh, a judgment in favor of the tenant or the case is withdrawn, um, and about a year if the judgment is in favor of the landlord. Um, And hopefully that uh, aims to help um, tenants uh, gain some stability after a, a rough patch. You're hearing Camila Vallejo here on Where We Live, Connecticut Public's housing reporter, as we talk about barriers renters and coming up potential home buyers are facing in the current market. I want to thank John Souza for joining us, president of the Connecticut Coalition of Property Owners, also a full-time landlord. John, thank you for your perspective, and we'll see what happens this this session. It's always interesting. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. Again, coming up, we're going to talk more about the barriers in Connecticut's rental and home buying market. You can join us too, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Earlier, we heard from Connecticut Public's housing reporter, Camila Vajejo, about the families who are struggling to afford rent or stay in their apartment now that the state rental assistance program, Unite CT, is no longer accepting new applications. The Hartford Current reported on Sunday, for every 100 extreme low-income households, there are just 42 rentals available and affordable to them. That's according to the Partnership for Strong Communities. And average rents have also increased in Connecticut by more than 15 percent year over year to nearly $1,800 a month. That's from a report from the state comptroller. We want to hear from you. What are you experiencing as a renter? You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Joining our conversation now on Zoom is Tammy Fellenstein, president of the Connecticut Association of Realtors. Tammy, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I understand you've been a realtor for some time. How would you describe the, the current market? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I was at an event last week and somebody said, oh, the market's so good. You must be so happy. And I said, to be honest with you, this is the most stressful, the most brutal, the most competitive market that I have ever seen. And the agents in the real estate community community are working harder than they ever have. When you talk about it being stressful and competitive, let's talk, let's first talk about the rental shortage and what realtors are seeing because realtors often help people find apartments. Absolutely. Um, you know, especially it, it's, it's always a progression. You help somebody rent something and then a couple years later they buy something a couple years later, they trade up, they have family. Um, you know, our business is based off of longevity and, and about establishing relationships. Um, but it's been, it's been very trying. Um, there's very, there's a, the, the inventory is historically low. I've never seen anything like this. So when you talk about inventory, so single family homes that are available with, uh, demand being high supply low, is that keeping more people in the rental market? And that's why we're also seeing increasing rents, Tammy. So honestly, in a typical market, if the rental market is strong, the sales market is generally not and vice versa. And this is really the first time that we're seeing a highly competitive market in both the sales and in the rental market. And it's just all a function of the strong demand that we have. Um, and, you know, there are reasons why the demand is so great because we have so many new factors adding, adding layers of what is a normal demand. Mm. Uh, when we talk about uh, inventory, when we think even for uh, places for families to live, there has been a lot, you know, debate last session and continues this session, Tammy, about how to find more affordable or build more affordable housing in Connecticut. There's a lack of multifamily homes, and that relates to, to down zoning laws. So where does your Realtors Association stand on efforts to increase housing statewide that's affordable when we talk about families and not just the elderly or single individuals. Right. I mean, our association supports any legislation that helps to layer in affordable housing. Um, the problem is, is, is it's, it's sort of like everybody thinks of affordable housing is great, but they don't necessarily want it in their neighborhood. <clears throat> and that becomes the struggle that legislators deal with um, because we desperately need affordable housing you know, whether it's requiring buildings to 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 um, segment a certain percentage of their buildings to affordable housing, to building new affordable housing closer to transportation centers, um, offering incentives. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to attack the to attack the problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cam Camila Vajejo is still here, Connecticut Public's housing reporter. Camila, um, can you add to that in terms of the context when we think about uh, the shortage and, and who's impacted here the most in our state? Absolutely, Lucy. Um, so at least in 2021, the Department of Housing commissioned uh, a comprehensive study of the future of affordable housing. And what that study found is that the state was lacking nearly 90,000 units for those who make 30% or less of the area median income. So that's our minimum wage workers, our grocery store workers, our janitors, and those who just aren't able to work for any given reason. Um, and in addition to that, our state is also, so not only is our state lacking housing for our most vulnerable, but Connecticut is also not building enough housing 
um, while this is preliminary data from the Department of Economic and Community Development, uh, in 2021, 3,677 housing permits were authorized. That's the lowest the state has seen since 2011. Uh, so, you know, it's the fact that we don't have enough housing for our most vulnerable communities, but also we're just not building enough for all uh, people in our state. May Beth shared with us in Waterbury where the Aryan medium uh, household income is about 42,000. Median property value is 130,000. Maybeth shares we have homes in, quote, the country club area priced at 450,000. Most residents can't afford such homes. We're being priced out. And, and can you speak to that, Camila? Uh, when, when we look at different parts of the state, um, you know, again, who's impacted the most? Absolutely, Lucy. So what the listener mentioned is definitely something that advocates have mentioned that we're seeing all across the state. You know, there's uh, specifically in Fairfield County, uh, which I can speak a little bit about, um, you know, there's an income disparity where uh, someone who who, um, makes around 30,000 a year um, is fighting for housing with someone who makes a lot more. Um, So again, in, in that fight, there's often a clear winner and the people who uh you know unfortunately don't make enough to uh continue to play this game are just being pushed into substandard housing conditions um or conditions this that aren't the best for them and where they have to work you know two to three jobs to even afford the rent um and, and you know that those kind of effects uh trickle down into other areas and Um, you know, it's definitely affecting uh, the most vulnerable in the state. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. We're interested to hear your experience, whether it's finding a a new apartment or maybe you're trying to break in and become a first-time homeowner. And as Tammy uh, Fellenstein mentioned, uh, you know, the the inventory is down and and all the factors that are leading uh, to people getting shut out. Again, our number, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Tammy, can you also give us some context on uh, housing permits? And I guess it depends uh, on what we're talking about in terms of Fairfield County versus uh, New Haven County, Hartford County, and how that varies. Well, the first thing I would say is, is, I mean, this is not just a Connecticut problem. Um, this is a national problem. And since, since the Great Recession, honestly, we've been underbuilding for, for 12 years. Um, they're saying, you know, nationally, we're probably 5 million units short. And the reason is, is that after the Great Recession, builders got skittish. They were afraid that if they build it, no one would come. Um, so they put the brakes on building. So we have not been adequately building and supply and adding new supply for a very long time. And now you add on top of that, we now have um, supply chain issues. We have cost of goods. You know, the price of lumber has skyrocketed. So there, we just have we've had a lot of obstacles. Uh, So we're hoping to look to the legislature to help with incentives um, to try and address some of these issues. Mm. When you mention incentives, can you tell us more, Tammy? Well, I I mean, I'm not a legislator, but we, you know, we would look to them to maybe offer grants or tax credits um, to to builders to to offer more affordable housing. I mean, we're just trying to help solve the problem. Camila, can you tell us when we t- think about some of the uh, the housing that is being built, whether it's in Fairfield County, New Haven County, uh, some of these apartments uh, that are being built, uh, are these, uh, again, pricing people out um, from the, the current supply that's out there? Yeah, Lucy. So, so one thing that I think advocates have mentioned a lot is that uh, there is housing being built, um, but it's often uh, luxury housing. Uh, which, you know, can can really price people out, especially people who uh, live and have lived in these cities for a very long time. Um, and, you know, in, in reality, uh, this housing is, you know, uh, attracting more people from out of state or maybe just not attracting uh, the people who really need housing, uh, kind of circling back to uh, the study by the uh, Department of Housing that found that uh, the group that's really lacking housing is low-income uh, residents in the state. Mm. 
Uh, Tammy, uh, we know that during the pandemic, people were moving from New York. Uh, maybe they were buying a second home. They wanted, uh, you know, more of, of uh, I guess, the, quote, country life here in Connecticut. But now that, you know, people are, are some of them are on hybrid work schedules, you know, how do you see uh, these, this trend continuing in the months ahead? Um, well, I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, when the whole, when the whole thing first started, it was really about fear and safety, the the mass exodus from Manhattan that we saw, and then you know now it's really about this is our new normal, um, and you know that's part of the reason why the demand is so much greater than it was, is we have this whole added layer of people who can now work from anywhere. Uh, statistically, nationally, there are between fourteen and twenty three million people who are thinking about moving because they have better options and because they can either work hybrid or they can work remotely. Um, and these people are willing to move between two and four hours away from where they are now. So for us in Connecticut, that's a very good thing. Um, but the other thing that you layer into it are these migration patterns, uh, whether it's in-state or out-of-state. So for example, I think Florida has had a mass income of, of, of well over 200,000 people have migrated to Florida with this whole migration. But now that some of the people in Florida are saying, you know what, now it's too crowded. We're gonna leave here and maybe we're gonna go back to Connecticut or we'll go to the Carolinas. And I think that on a smaller scale in Connecticut, um, if you have people that, if they think Fairfield County is too crowded, then maybe they're gonna go up to Litchfield County or there's gonna be, they're gonna migrate to other parts of the states that maybe are cheaper and because they can do it now because uh, they have the option to work remotely. I mentioned first-time homeowners home uh, earlier, uh, Tammy, and when we think about uh, what you and your colleagues are seeing, people putting down cash offers and how that prevents people who are still trying to get their first starter home when we talk about this demand and inventory uh, being low. I know. I Listen, I hate to say it, but it, it's, it's discouraging because obviously cash is king. Um, if you're a, if you're selling a property and you have ten offers um, and you know three of them are cash versus taking someone who's got a mortgage where it's, there's a possibility that their mortgage won't come through um, or or it won't appraise. I mean, so there are other complications. So cash really is king at this point, and we're we're seeing more cash offers now than we ever have in, in every price range. Hmm. It, it does sound discouraging. Uh, Camila, I wanted to just uh, end with you uh, when we think about uh, how lawmakers are considering this uh, housing issue uh, in our state, uh, you know, uh, beyond uh, looking to expand uh, Unite CT potentially to help people um, who are having trouble paying the rent. When we think about um, building more housing that's affordable to all, you know, is there momentum this session? Absolutely, Lucy. So what we've seen so far, and I think the bills that are important to know, um, is one that's uh, going through the Planning and Development Committee, uh, which uh, would uh, up the amount of housing around uh, transit stations. Uh, so that's uh, one that's had a lot of push since even last session. Uh, and really what that would do is just, um, you know, make our transit centers uh you know, more appealing to people of all uh, different incomes. And, you know, having the fact that it's so close to transit, um, you know, it also opens the, avail the, the option of having a very walkable community, a very uh, environmental friendly community. So that's a really big push um, this session. And then the other one is a fair share bill. And what that means is that all, um, it would evaluate uh, what, what each uh, community or how much housing each community can build as far as affordable housing goes. So the burden doesn't fall on, um, you know, our biggest cities like New Haven and Stanford and, uh, you know, Hartford, uh, but it would also fall on the more suburban towns, let's say like Westport, Darien, Greenwich. Uh, so that's a bill that's gotten a lot of support. Um, and, uh, you know, that is, is currently um, being evaluated by legislators. Mm. 
And this is a big election year, so we'll be curious to see if lawmakers uh, make any moves on these potential proposals. Uh, some of those towns that you have mentioned, Camila, also uh, firm uh, pushbacks uh, related to expanding and changing uh, some of the zoning around these areas. We'll wait to see what happens, but thank you so much, Camila Vajejo, for joining us, Connecticut Public's housing reporter, also core member with Report for America. Thanks for all the context you provided. Absolutely, anytime. And Tammy Fellenstein was here, president of the Connecticut Association of Realtors. Tammy, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about some of the structural barriers that keep people from becoming homeowners. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. As we've talked about this hour, there's a lot of demand for single family homes, but not enough homes on the market which lead to higher prices. This also impacts the rental market, too, where demand has led to increasing rents. There are also structural barriers that keep people from becoming homeowners. Joining us now with some perspective on that, on Zoom with us, Joshua Devine, Director of Racial Economic Equity at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Joshua, welcome to our show. Hello. Uh, Good morning. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your role uh, with uh, the coalition and the data that uh, you're collecting related to, you know, who's most uh, impacted when we talk about people being shut out of, of, of housing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the National Community Reinvestment Coalition is a coalition of grassroots community and economic development organizations. And our focus really is to work closely with them, uh, with these members to create opportunities for people and households to, to build wealth. And we do that by uh, championing fairness in banking and housing and business development uh, and working alongside researchers, policy experts, strategi- uh, strategists, organizers, et cetera. Um, uh, the department that I, I, I head up, the economic equity department, really focuses on thinking about the economic conditions of people of color and its impact it has on uh, the opportunity to kind of build wealth. So as we're thinking about what that means in terms of home ownership, um, I think it's 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 obvious and clear that home ownership is a critical path towards home t- towards wealth and wealth creation. But we've seen just in the, in the data that we've parsed through and taken a look at national trends that there's still a persistent home ownership gap uh, between um, uh, people of color in this country. More specifically, the gap between the black home ownership and uh, and and their white counterparts, and that persistent gap in black home ownership has has uh, has widened and has been an issue for, for the past few decades. Mm. The numbers are, are startling. Uh, I believe it's uh, about a little more than four out of 10 um, black people in our country are homeowners. But when you compare that to uh, white people, seven out of 10 white people own homes. And so when we think about how lenders um, you know, are part of this, right? Um, mm-hmm. you know, are they tracking this data? And, you know, what can be changed? It's surprising even after the recession if that's not happening. Yeah, absolutely. So NCRC takes a look at the housing market from the lender vantage point. Um, so through the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, we can really explore and assess um, home purchase loans, refinance and activity, and really take a look at financial institutions and their impact on actually expanding home ownership. And uh, we're seeing a lot of really interesting data coming out of our reporting. Um, There is a clear correlation between, um, for example, low income households and lending activity. So um, more more households are being denied mortgages in areas where there's really low income. Um, And and a lot of that has to do with some of the reasons kind of noted earlier today. Uh, We also have what we call a a fair lending tool that allows kind of stakeholders to examine lending patterns over the past few years. And just taking a closer look at uh, Connecticut, for example, I think Hartford region showed that, you know, black applicants are kind of two times more likely to deny the home purchase loan um, as as compared to to other counterparts. Um, And primarily the reasons for denial include, uh, you know, 
debt to income issues, collateral issues and credit issues, which have historically been um, persistent issues across the board for people of color. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of interesting activity happening and, and the need to think about how we you know, continue to hold our lenders accountable to, to lending to these uh, population cohorts. When you when we talk about home ownership and affordability, you also make a point to, to emphasize that this also relates to the workforce. And when we think about wage stagnation, and these are other mm-hmm. factors that impact a person's ability to own their first home. Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, you know home ownership is costly. You know you have to you know understand uh, closing costs and down payments or assistance or down payments. And uh, that's not likely for uh, a household or a person who is in a lower wealth or lower financial condition. And what we know about uh, COVID and the pandemic and what has happened to families, that uh, the pandemic has uh, disproportionately impacted people of color, uh, particularly those who did not have a good financial uh, situation even at the start of the pandemic. So yes, uh, you know, as families are experiencing income instability, wage disparity, it only uh, widens the the barrier that exists for people to actually explore and uh, purchase their first home. When you think about some of the traditional expectations uh, when someone's buying uh, their first home to 20% down, that's a lot of money. And and, and many Americans, unfortunately, don't have that type of savings. I know our state in Connecticut, Mm -hmm. um, there are specific programs where instead of 20% down, they can uh, can, uh, get a a loan maybe with 3% down. Are you seeing more states Mm -hmm. uh, with these types of programs, Joshua? Sure. Yeah, I think there are kind of two responses to that. Uh, yes, there are programs at the you know local and regional levels that are really working closely to ensure that there is you know equitable products and services supporting these families with lower wealth conditions. We have a network of housing counseling agencies that work on this all the time. Who are trying to innovate in this space uh, to increase uh, uh, opportunity for people of color. But there are there are there's more that can be done at the institution level. The, with, with, with banking institutions, with financial service service companies, to really strengthen access uh, to home ownership through product innovation. And I think the more that we could create a policy environment, a regulatory environment that kind of supports this kind of innovation um, and holds institutions accountable, the better. You've been hearing Joshua Devine here on Where We Live, uh, Director of the Racial and Economic Equity at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Joshua, thank you for your perspective today. No worries. Thank you. You've been listening to Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. We'll be back tomorrow focused on pandemic babies or infants born shortly before or during the pandemic who haven't had as much interaction with the outside world. We're going to talk about how the pandemic could impact these infants long term and what pediatricians are seeing. Did you have a pandemic baby? We hope you join us tomorrow. 